did you become interested in gerontology? Oh, I've been interested in gerontology for a very long time. I, I guess it started with a really good relationship with my grandparents, mm -hmm. and particularly my grandmother. Um, my, my father died when I was really young, and my grandparents were really sort of second parents to me. And we spent, my, me and my sister spent a lot of time with them. Um, I started spending a lot of time with my grandfather. He died early, and sh my grandmother was always in the background. He was a much more upfront, charismatic character. She was sort of more quiet and stable. But over the years, I just became very, very close to her, um, spent a lot of time with her, and got a lot of her wisdom. And that, I think, was really what started me on the road to working with older people, is how much you can learn from them and um, you know, why they are so important in this world. And it's been my life's passion, so I guess she really stuck with me. Describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist. Ooh, I sort of have a crazy career. Um, I, I started out in, um, in actually doing oral histories uh, as a museum curator after my undergraduate days at the University of Pennsylvania. And I was working with immigrant groups, mostly elderly people who had come to this country from places all over the world. and. I was helping to sort of build a collection of artifacts that would document the history of immigration in the United States. It was a, called the Balch Institute, which actually still exists today in Philadelphia. But as I was doing that work, I just you know realized how much I just loved this interaction with older people, and it just stuck with me. So I ended up going back to graduate school at the University of Pittsburgh, and I majored in public policy focused on aging policy went to AARP in 1978 uh, as the deputy assistant, a deputy assistant for a, a program called Tax Aid, which actually still exists today. Uh, we helped older people as volunteers. We helped them to do their taxes and um, went all over the country with that program. So again, I was really in the community uh, looking and seeing at, at what everybody was doing. Um, at that point, I had applied for a presidential management internship, was, which was the first year of that program in the federal government. And I was part of that first class. We had a lot of really great people who have gone on to do all kinds of things. I was uh, placed at um, the Office of Human Development Services, which was then in HEW. This was before um, the renaming of, before education left, and they created the Department of Health and Human Services. And I was the desk officer for the Administration on Aging. So this is in 1979. Um, I was already working with AOA. And the funny thing is about, that was in 79. In 97, I spent a year as the Assistant Secretary for Aging. And while I was there, somebody found a memo that I had written as a desk officer for AOA in the 70s. And it was really very funny that that sort of consistency was there. So I worked for the federal government and decided that I wanted to go back and get my doctorate. So I went into public health school. And of course, as usual, in these schools, there's a lot of focus on maternal and child health. Uh, and in, at Berkeley, which is where I went, also a heavy focus on international health, but almost nothing on aging. So I had to create my own program. And uh, I worked with Dr. Mary Minkler, who actually just retired from University of California. She was my chair of my committee. Um, I worked with Henrik Bloom, who was the first um, board chair for the Over 60s Clinic, which was the first federally qualified health center in the United States to serve the elderly. So I had some really good mentors. And then I went to work at UCSF with Carol Estes, who became one of my early mentors in aging. And um, we worked on, we, we ran a center for health and aging at UCSF in the early 80s for AOA. So I continued to do all my work really um, through working at UCSF, doing my studies at Berkeley, doing my dissertation on the health effects of retirement for older women, women through a grant that actually came from 
uh, the Retirement Researcher Foundation early on. So I had a small grant to actually do this study over at UCSF. So everything just tied together. And then I left and came to back to Washington, D.C. and worked at what is now the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality uh, as a researcher. And I did one of the first studies of family caregiving uh, using 1982 data from the National Long-Term Care Survey. And I wrote sort of a seminal piece on caregiving in America. It was, um, I did a detail with Olympia Snow's office. She was then a representative on the Hill. And that exploding the myths caregiving in America became just widespread. This is way before a lot of people even knew the term. I had actually worked with Elaine Brody, who I think of as the grandmother of caregiving research. She, she just died this past year. She would have, well, was also a fabulous mentor who was in her 90s when she died, still writing on gerontology even last year. Um, Elaine had sort of mentored me around caregiving issues, and then I took that ball and started doing a lot of work using secondary data analysis to really understand what was family caregiving and what did it look like. So from there, I went to a number of different jobs, including working at the Pepper Commission, which was the first commission to look at uh, the future of healthcare and long-term care in the United States. That was in 89. Pepper had just died, and um, um, Rockefeller became the chair of that commission. And I ran the long-term care group for that group and focused really on sort of how do we finance and how do we liver, deliver good long-term services and supports to elders and, and younger people. Um, after that job, uh, I went, left the feds and went to Project HOPE, Center for Health Affairs, where I continued doing mostly research on aging. I looked at issues around long-term care policy. I looked at the home care workforce in you know, the late eight, not 80s when hardly anybody was really looking at those issues. And um, I got a call from a colleague of mine who I had worked with at the Pepper Commission who said, the President Clinton is starting a health care task force. Would you come and run the long-term care group? So I spent the next year, uh, two years actually, in the White House working on the health care plan of Clinton, which of course did not pass, but we developed a pretty nifty long-term care proposal, I think, um, which parts still sort of pieces of that, particularly the home and community-based expansion, really emerged from that. And then I moved to the Department of Health and Human Services as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Aging, Disability, and Long-Term Care Policy. And I was there for four years, and we did a whole lot of things. We developed the first consumer-directed program called Cash and Counseling, which was demonstrated in three states around the country. We did a lot, lot of work on long-term care financing. We did a lot of the early work on how uh, disabled elderly are cared for in managed care, because in the 90s, there was a whole sort of emergence of managed care, and people were really worried about what's going to happen to chronically disabled elderly in those kinds of systems. Um, so that was an incredible experience because we were really able to, as, as the policy office for the Department of Health and Human Services, we were really able to bridge a whole lot of different worlds um, and go across agencies both within the department as well as with HUD and with some other agencies as well to try to sort of push these aging issues. Ninety-six, uh, Secretary Shalala asked me to go and work at, at AOA as the um, Assistant Secretary for Aging, which I did for a year. And then I moved to New York to work with um, doc Dr. Robert Butler, who is no longer alive. He died a, f a few years ago. But um, I took over as the CEO of the International Longevity Center, which was established by him and uh, Jack Rowe at Mount Sinai at that time to look at international issues. And we had four or five sister agencies in other countries, in England and France, in Singapore, um, and in the UK, and, we, and in Japan. So we worked with these other sister groups to really start to try to develop an international agenda. Um, but then in 99, uh, the head of 
Bleeding Age, which is my association that I work today, which was then the American Association of Homes and Services for the Aging, mm -hmm. asked me if I would come and start a new um, policy institute. So I did, and I have been there ever since. Um, mm -hmm. It's been a fabulous ride. I love it. I worked on um, a lot of issues that are focused on on the ground aging services providers and how they actually care for elderly. Uh, Leading Age is a nonprofit association of about 6,000 aging services providers that run the gamut from nursing home to assisted living, home and community-based care, and, and a lot of low-income ha senior housing. We're doing a lot of work now on senior housing linked with services to help low-income seniors remain in their apartments and in their communities. And we also do a lot of work around the elder care workforce development, uh, particularly, fo particularly focused on frontline. Currently, me and my staff are doing a lot of research on the home health workforce. But we also focus a lot on the entire range of workforce that is needed to, to really support this sector. And through that time, I have just had I love it. I mean, I can't believe I've been at this job for 15 years, but it's been a great opportunity to do what I like to do best, which is to bridge the worlds of research, practice, and policy. I'm a trained researcher, and I love research, but I am not a fan of academic sitting on the shelf work. So we do a lot of translation. We work with providers to get what we learn into practice, and we also translate what we learn into policy. And, um, and I know we're going to talk more about the mentoring, but I have to say in all of these jobs, the most exciting part of those jobs has been that I've had junior staff that I've been able to help and nurture and support, as well as colleagues that I've been able to support in, in sort of growing in their jobs. So. so at what point in your career did you embrace gerontologists to describe yourself? Oh, that's been from the beginning. Because the 70s was, in the 70s was really the, I would say in some strange ways, the heyday of gerontology. Mm -hmm. Because gerontology was just getting started. Um, the, the, departments, the departments or certificates of gerontology were just developing. There was a lot of money that was being put into the system the Administration on Aging had a lot of, they had a big discretionary budget that would support those kinds of things. So that's really when the word became popularized. So I would say I've been identified as a gerontologist my entire career. Almost with, with the exception maybe of my first job where I was working with immigrant populations. But at, at, as soon as I was at, um, started in my master's program and was at AARP. It was just the, that was the profession that you were in. Mm -hmm. and, and what was so exciting about that was that gerontology is very interdisciplinary and it very intraprofessional, mm -hmm. which carried me through my doctorate program, public health, which is also very intra, interdisciplinary and intraprofessional. So it's a perfect match. I know you mentioned some female mentors. Um, how did they impact your move into gerontology? Well, I, I don't think they impacted my move into it. They impacted my move through it. So, for example, Carol Estes opened a lot of doors for me in, in Washington. Um, she was very connected. We were connected through the Center on uh, Health and and aging, and she was extremely helpful in introducing me to people, not just people who might provide me with jobs, but also colleagues, uh, as well as continuing to, I mean, writing with her, I was able to then get some more exposure that way. Similarly, Mary, Mary Minkler, uh, I wrote with her, co-authored a number of, of articles as a student, so it really moved me. She, Mary really pushed me into getting much more engaged in both the Gerontological Society, ASA, as well as the American Public Health Association, which has had a strong gerontological health program, although I'm, 
I'm, I'm not as happy as I could be with the lack of focus of aging in public health, but that's for another discussion. <laughs> so they were very influential in helping me to move into these jobs. Um, somebody like Elaine Brody, who was a already an icon in the field too, who was at Philadelphia Geriatric at that point, she more was more helpful in terms of thinking through the concepts of family caregiving. What does it mean? How do we apply it? I also worked very closely with Pal Lawton, who was at Philadelphia Geriatric, who if you want to talk about a mentor, he is was an exemplar. He mentored everybody. And I didn't even live in Philadelphia. I met Pal long distance, and he remained a mentor of mine till the day he died. So, so those were sort of the, the kinds of things. Opening up doors, um, being thought leaders and, and, and sharing thoughts and ideas and concepts, writing together. Uh, Judy Fader, who was another mentor of mine, Judy is the, was the person who ran the uh, Pepper Commission and then became the deputy, uh, uh, deputy assistant secretary in ASPE and really was running the White House uh, healthcare plan together with Ira Magaziner, and Judy was the one who called me and said, "Will you take over the long-term care group?" And you know, this was in the early '90s. I was young, and I'm thinking, "How can I run an entire group with 60 people on it in the White House?" And you know, she said, "Of course you can do that." And so it's that kind of a thing that giving you the the um, the infrastructure, the opportunity, and the encouragement that you can do anything that you want. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been what's been so significant for these folks, to really be there for you and to give you that kind of support in your life. being in gerontology as a woman. I don't think it's particularly unique being a gerontologist as a woman because it's such a, you know, a dominated field anyway. I think what's unique about being a woman, being a gerontologist in general, is that you have the opportunity to have a wide view of the world as it affects and elderly and, and aging, and it's, it's a lens that doesn't limit you to particular perspective. And I think that people coming in from a particular discipline, uh, you come in from economics, or you come in from sociology, or you come in from political science, or whatever, you're going to have a particular view, but the gerontologist lens with you this broad view, and it has also given you this incredible network of people from all different kinds of walks of life, academic, that's the uniqueness of that. Um, what's, what's positive about being a female gerontologist is that these issues are so overwhelmingly related to women's issues whether you look at the feminization of poverty, or if you look at uh, issues around family caregiving, or you look at, uh, you know, the, where people live, how they live, um, differences between men and women, and longevity, 